Hey everyone, welcome to another episode. Uh, today we are going to be exploring um, arriving and leaving well in the context of greater than. And uh, it's interesting even using those words um, and choosing those words rather than, uh, I don't know, being hired um, and then either resigning or, or leaving in some other way. Uh, everything about greater than um, is relational. And so it would be, I don't know, maybe expected or acknowledged that our way of attracting um, people to the system or our way of uh, creating the conditions by which people become interested and curious about greater than either from uh, a potential client to uh, a potential uh, participant is uh, different than a traditional organization. The the um, metaphor that I use quite a lot is it feels like for me that in some ways we, through our consistent and persistent storytelling, messaging, sharing, it's like we're standing on top of a mountain with like a Tibetan singing bowl, right? And we're hearing people are hearing this particular resonance. And if they're attracted to that by something they read, something they hear, something someone has said, uh, they might choose to hmm, write a note or join the mailing list or attend a academy session or attend one of our, um, uh, you know, um, um, conversations. Uh, and the other way is through relationships. And since, you know, especially, you know, not exclusively, but Fran and I coming from the more uh, community network type of uh, collectives, that the trust that is paramount in orienting oneself around a livelihood, especially in a way that is not traditional, uh, is just different. Fran, I'm wondering if you could talk about, you know, I guess the beginning and how and why greater than, I don't know, I think that you've shared that it was never really a choice but how greater than has kind of landed on these concentric circles of uh, orientation to the system. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I guess it's really important to understand that greater than really grew out of two communities, the Inspiral community and the WeShare community, and that especially the, the sort of first pool of people or the different configurations that were involved really came from those two groups. And so that there was a huge amount of sort of cultural heritage that we were building on and things that were just already obvious, like this is how we do things. This is uh, the culture we're in. These are certain practices we have. And I think one of the one of the elements that I've experienced, especially uh, through a lot of years in WeShare, was basically being in, in, a, in a configuration where there, there is no recruitment process in a traditional way at all. Um, and it being, I would say we share quite on the extreme end of people needing to basically find their way in and navigate around and either get completely lost or somehow uh, get into the middle because they have enough stamina and persistence and as we sometimes call it cultural fit to like get in. But so I think um, from having seen the different pros and cons of that kind of model, it just felt really clear to me that there wasn't another way that we were going to try in greater than that we would just sort of build on that tradition. And that also we had so many uh, strong high trust connections already from those groups that really was like our, our seed circle to get started. And so I guess just to maybe briefly touch on these concentric circles that Susan was mentioning that we have in greater than, this is really something that has been the result of several years of evolution. So we did not start with this at all. At first, there was just a group of a few people working on something together. But basically now we have three levels of engagement. So we have the partners who are formally speaking the shareholders of the organization. 
but shareholders really from the perspective of stewards. So they're taking care of the organization with very much of a long-term view and greater than is their main professional home. Then the second circle around that is the associates. So those are people where sometimes we, we use the, the polyamory uh, like uh, lingo for this, who basically have multiple partners. They may be part of another organization or multiple organizations where they do their professional work but they're basically part of the core group of people that are really uh, stewarding greater than, developing it, doing projects and doing their work professionally through greater than. So the associates and the partners really, we, we call them the members because that's the people that are making decisions and doing work. And then we have what we now call explorers after some evolution. And that's sort of this outer layer in which there's many, many different ways of showing up and interacting. And basically, it's our way of creating sort of a, a touch point, a launch pad, a pool of people that we resonate with that have heard the Tibetan singing bowl or had someone say, hey, come on, I really want you to check this out and see if this is interesting. And it's basically a way to test out and get to know us and sort of be just in the flow of what we're doing, how we're communicating the work we're doing. And from that to sort of navigate forward and see if if greater than is a good fit and if you want to step further in or whether maybe it's not the right place. So yeah, those are that's that's our current structure in that regard. And maybe maybe later on, if it makes sense, we can say more about how you actually get into those roles. But maybe I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, thanks for that, Fran. Um... I, and I think that it, as both of us have, as you mentioned, come from the the, the communities of We Share. I mean, you were We Share and Inspiral, me primarily uh, in Spiral, of trying to figure out how to uh, understand the needs and requirements that are different from a community of quote unquote volunteers or people that are, that are interested in particular topics and maybe getting. Um, uh, not paid from the center, but uh, loosely orienting a livelihood around a community, as opposed to greater than being um, conceived uh, and instantiated as a, uh, a collective for livelihood. Uh, what do you see as the key difference um, with it, with, uh, with greater than? And then maybe I'll talk a little bit about um, how uh, the Inspiral livelihood pods um, experiments kind of fed into this as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a pretty, a pretty key, uh, point because, uh, for all the, the great things that we learned and experimented with, we share and in spiral they they are different in their typology, let's say. So as you were saying, Susan, we share and in spiral are what I would call communities first and greater than is a business first to say it very bluntly. It's a very different like alternative type of business. And it definitely has very uh, many elements of community or I would say my conception of a successful business, the type that I wanna be part of also has a community that develops as basically a side effect or one of the things that comes along with it, but it's not a community first. And I think the point where this is really essential about how people um, join and leave is basically that in something that's a community first, I would say it's really about belonging, it's about values, and it's about this idea almost of family in a way that you can't be kicked out of your family, right? Like, of course, there, there can be huge fights and people fall out, and then they sometimes do leave, right? But that's very different than, hey, you really uh, are not performing uh, on the project work that we're doing with these clients in a way that is aligned with our organization. Maybe this isn't a good fit, right? That's a really, really different uh, situation. And there's a really different set of risks, right? Because in greater than, since our objective is to make a livelihood for all of us in the collective, we need to hold that very carefully. And we have to think about our reputation and the work we're delivering and the quality of that. And this is something that's very hard to put onto a community, an expectation of quality, because what's more important there is 
the togetherness, the support, like it's okay wherever you're at, you're learning and you're experimenting and these are great sandboxes. And so I really think that both of those dynamics are really valuable and important. Like we need to have both, but we can't conflate them and they need to have different dynamics around, uh, yeah, joining and leaving. And so in greater than, of course, it's professional. So there's a certain professional expectation of where you're at and the type of work you do when you join and that might lead to you realizing that you're not the right fit. Uh, it depends. But yeah, in a community, it's uh, kicking people out, let's say, to make it very bluntly, it has a very different dynamic to it. And I think is a lot harder or less based on the work you're doing. No, absolutely. And I think that I think that the certainly what I've learned and what I learned through Inspiral is uh, relationships first and really um, having a very clear understanding of alignment around the principles of what we do and how we do it as being the primary primary element to how somebody um i don't want to say welcomed in but the 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 assumption of uh the expectation when somebody enters um enters the environment or the community and that's why i think that the explorers ring is so important is it's not a community i mean it is but it's not right it's you 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 would you would join as an explorer enter as an explorer into greater than with the intention of orienting around could this be a place for me to express part or all of my livelihood so it's 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 it's, it's very different from that perspective and i think that what i learned in in spiral as we were starting to experiment with livelihood more explicitly uh I was part of a, a, a company, a livelihood pod experiment, where uh, it was basically this very high trust scenario of four of us coming together and deciding for a period of time to collectivize our, um, our money and uh, work on the separate projects that we were trying to build up. So in the case of myself, it was around my consulting and coaching practice. Um, in the case of uh, Joshua Weil, who is one of the, uh, is the founder of Inspiral, it was around um, the Inspiral Dev Academy. And uh, in the case of uh, Damien Sligo Green, also a, um, a longstanding member of Inspiral, it was uh, his uh, Bamboo uh, Creative, which is, a, which is a design studio. And what we decided to do was to come together for a period of time as our different entities were growing, collectivize our money, come together at the end of every month, decide if we wanted to just split it three ways or how we wanted to kind of navigate that. And over the course of a couple of years, we were able to um, uh, create the conditions where each of our individual ventures were healthy enough to exist on their own. Now, what we noticed here is it wasn't a company, right? Because we were doing different things, right? We were trying to express our livelihoods in different ways. So then when the opportunity or the essence of greater than as it started to morph from being um, uh, solely stewards of uh, co-budget and collective, um, that type of collective, moving into a place where like relaxing, it's like, okay, like we're here in a place and we're, we're trying to do, we're trying to do the same thing, right? There wasn't this disparity of different types of businesses. Um, the uh, relief of, I think from my perspective, having practiced with money and livelihood in this way allowed us to um, almost seamlessly uh, incorporate that into the business that is now greater than. Um, and I just curious, Fran, before I uh, move to Lisa and ask, you know, what your experience has been like, what, what was what was it like for you, Fran, when the livelihood started being um, the key component to the community or whatever we want to call this? I'm, I'm getting confused myself. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not that easy to answer that question somehow from like where I sit, because 
for me, like the moment I realized that I wanted to like build a new thing, a new home for myself, uh, livelihood was always in the middle. Like that was always my desire. And to be honest, that was also my desire. And we share that was what I was trying and it didn't work for different reasons. And I was very frustrated by that. So it was sort of like, you keep trying at the same problem until you figure out the way to make it work. And that it just, uh, it took me quite long to be able to articulate that very well. And it seems like it actually took a few years uh, for that like wish to say, hey, how can this be the, the word professional home that we use a lot? Like that is really what to me resonates. It's like, yes, this is a place where, you know, since we're choosing to work in these ways that are very emergent, very uncertain, changing all the time, we need some kind of like anchor that we can be in together. And so, yeah, I think for me, that just always felt really important. And I, I agree that it somehow feels easier to do that with people that have chosen a certain set of focuses and that it isn't too broad because somehow it's hard to really align your interests enough. And that I think does then go again to this, in these broader networks and communities, usually you find a lot of sort of solo freelancers that really enjoy then collaborating with people on different projects. But if you wanna build something bigger, let's say, that has a, a bigger impact in a specific area, I think it's good to, to connect with people that really wanna do the same type of work in a way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like, like Lisa, I think about our, you know, Tibetan singing bowl is one thing. And I suppose in some ways, like the Tibetan singing bowl of Inspiral reached your ears before we actually met and hugged in the street, right? Um, and just really curious how I think in the combination of somebody hearing the singing bowl, uh, getting closer, building the relationship, and but then one of us in the greater than system really like falling in love a little bit. And it's like, oh, right. Like doing like that seduction dance of, ooh, Lisa would be really great in this um, little, you know, home home collective that we're building. How can we, how can we bring her closer? And not it, not in a manipulative kind of way, but just in a really curious, like, uh, I'm falling a little bit in love with this person. And I think I would love to do more. What, what was it like for you, Lisa? Well, before I even say what it was like for me, I'm loving hearing these origin stories of where this came from, what you were thinking about, how it came into this, you know, concentric rings of members and explorers. And because when I arrived, all that was poof, it was just here. I just accepted it as, okay, this is it. This is how it works. But um, I, I suppose it could happen faster for other people. But for me, this was a multi-year process before I even got close enough to become an explorer in greater than. And um, I think it was a uh, definitely a, an exercise in paying attention to the synchronicities. Because the fact that I'm in a retreat with a bunch of people speaking is French Canadian speakers in the you know, countryside of Montreal. And one of the people there is there as the partner of one of the other folks. She wasn't even supposed to be part of the retreat. She ended up doing some things that were that were, she learned it in Spiral. It's the first time I ever heard of in Spiral. Two weeks later, I'm in New Zealand. And uh, this guy, Colin Basterfield, who I've known from the Agile community, hands me a book called Doing Better Work Together. And I noticed Susan's name, Basterfield. Oh, this must be your wife. Oh, this is great. And I started reading that book and could not put it down. And I told Colin that. And then, you know, as you say, Susan, we met each other for the first time on the street. And I thought I was just going to wave to Colin's wife, you know, like just, you know, wave through the window. She jumps out of the car. She hugs me. She's like, you don't know how much your work has has inflamed my work. And I'm like, I'm so excited about your work. I mean, you're opening a whole new world to me. So that's how it started. But then we were, you know, friends, basically pandemic pals. We help each other through the pandemic. We, uh, you know, talked every month and just caught up on life and talked about work and, you know, talked about everything. And somehow it hadn't dawned on me that greater than was a place that I could get closer to. I was very, I was aware that Susan was a partner in greater than, but I didn't know enough about it to know that it was joinable. 
you know, and I guess it was coming up to the um, yearly opt-in ceremony, probably when you thought about me, Susan, and you said, you know, do you want to become an explorer? And I'm like, um, yeah, sure. I mean, like to me, I was thinking like, what's the downside? Like not much. I mean, let me just get in here and see what this is like. You know, and I had been a solo printer at this point for three or four years after having sold my um, agile coaching development and training business. And so I was pretty lonely, you know, so I was, I was ripe for, you know, other, other people to be with. But then from that point, it was another year of being an explorer and doing some um, internal initiatives with greater than and getting to know more people and sort of seeing, I thought it was beautiful as an explorer, how much I was privy to how I could see how the organization worked, how I could see what business development stuff was going on, for example, and how decisions were made and all that. I could see the daily communications. It was incredible. Um, but then again, like a year later, when another partner, Mary contacted me and said, have you thought about becoming an associate? I'm like, oh, I guess I could do that. It just, it hadn't dawned on me. And I don't know why. I was just very happy and comfortable in each place. And now I'm very happy and comfortable as an associate. So um, I think there is something about the having someone to pay attention to you when you're in the system to find out how is it going? How's it, are you getting what you want? You know, are you moving closer to greater than or are you moving out? Um, and in my case, it just, I mean, like one conversation with Mary about, should I, you know, try to become an associate? And I was like, yeah, I do want more of my livelihood to be, to be associated with these people. I want to do more work with these people. I want to do more of the kind of the work they're attracting. So I guess it's a very long-winded story, but I, but I think it's, I think the long-windedness is because it's so relationship-based, at least the way I came in, which is not the way that everyone comes in necessarily, but um, it's not necessarily a short process. And it can be a short process. Like Fran, when you think about inviting, invitation, like sometimes I have to pinch myself when I think about how did we, how did we go from four people to 80 people in like three or four years? Um, talk about that from, from your perspective. What is the, you know, there's one thing for people to come and uh, get interested. I like one of the roles that I, um, one of my favorite roles that I energize currently is called first responder. So uh, for people that are um, interested that drop a note via the, you know, the greater than website or any other ways to um, be curious, like that's one of my favorite things to do is make that first contact, ask, ask them like, were you interested in, would you like a call? What's, what's going on? Um, I also call, I like to call that like my ambassadoring work. Um, it's some, sometimes it doesn't come to anything, but oftentimes it does like having that first conversation and, and hearing what people are curious about and making those introductions is one way that somebody can start to um, find their way into explorership, but maybe talk about um, the more organic um, manifestation of that friend. Yeah, I think organic is a good keyword because I'm definitely always very inspired by that. Of like, how can you create a sort of a system design that mimics how people in a normal organic process would just get involved in something that doesn't feel like cosmetic and like, oh, now I'm going here and suddenly I'm in this thing and I have to find my way around. Um, so yeah, I think that like, what's quite important to think about is where do you have boundaries that are like quite strong and where are they looser? And like how, how permissive basically. And I think that in the case of greater than, because of how we're set up and the type of work we're doing, it makes a lot of sense that we have basically one layer, the explorer layer, that's really very easy to get into. And I think this is something that, yeah, you can really, I would recommend for a lot of this type of organization, let's say. And then one where the stakes get a lot higher, and then there's a significantly higher barrier, uh, barrier to entry. 
but that basically to come into the sandbox and to start playing, it's really a, a pretty a pretty low ticket because in a way there's a whole what you could sort of call like a, a filtration or it's like maybe it's like a dating process. It's a, like it's a it's a two sided or multi sided process of getting to know each other and figuring out like is this the place that I want to invest more energy in, and so basically to become an explorer you really just need one other member to invite you. And basically they just do a very light touch check beforehand with other members in, in case there's like any objections, because sometimes there might be, I don't know, someone who's had a huge conflict or bad experience with someone in another context. And that's, we want to make sure to surface those kind of things. Like it's important to, to have that collective knowledge, but basically, yeah, one person can decide on their own to invite someone in. And then when you're an explorer, there's all these different opportunities of how you can get involved and basically be more in an observer stance or start jumping more into action. And that really depends a lot on your own attitude, where you're at, what you need at that moment. And the idea really is that almost more like you, you shift roles when you're already behaving like the next level role. Like, I think that's a really important principle so it's, you know, someone who comes into the system as an explorer and is like, I am here to become a partner because that's the top of the ladder. Like that's something that is quite uh, off-putting to me <laughs> because like that's really not, yeah, the way we work. But it's more so, yeah, I'm exploring, I'm trying out things. And if it works well, if I'm enjoying myself, if I'm building good relationships and starting to do meaningful work, then it naturally makes sense to step in further. And so basically, um, in connection with that very easy way to get into that first layer, which might be because I sent an email to the Greater Than website and just had some conversations and someone said, hey, like, let's invite you in. Or it might be because I've known someone for many years and they proposed me. So there's really many ways for that to happen. But that then basically to become an associate, we, we do a consensus decision with all members. So that's something that happens on our decision-making tool, Lumio. And consensus actually, like, this is the only type of decision currently that is a consensus decision. And that was quite intentional. And who knows, it might change at some point, especially as we grow, it becomes harder and harder to have full consensus on these kind of things. But for now, the assumption really is, to go back to this importance of trust, is that actually having that boundary held really, really strongly. And that if there's some kind of doubt about somebody, like if someone really is like, I disagree with this person joining, that that's enough of a signal to say, okay, um, it might not be safe enough for everyone then who's already there. And I think it's important for people to, to trust that they can invest in greater than if they're a member, because maybe not a bunch of other people will join that, that they really uh, don't feel good about and that they have the power to, to stop that basically. So yeah, for now, that's basically how it works. And I would say there really is no sort of uh, easy way to explain how you get from explorer to associate because that process, it really is, I feel like we're always debating also this combination of how much supporting do we do and like giving people guidance and handholding and what is way too much because we're a self-organized collective and you need to figure things out on your own. So if we make it too easy, we're sort of giving you a completely wrong understanding of how we actually operate. So part of it is also finding your own way and figuring out what you want and communicating it and putting it out there, which can be a bit scary. But yeah, I think finding that balance is important. And depending on the type of org you are, you might need to put the cursor in a different place. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we are a duocracy, right? We are a self-organized collective and, and that in and of itself is, can be very off-putting to people. I, you know, I, and I, I, I have experienced this a little bit in greater than, but obviously more so in inspire world where people come in and it's like, Oh, I'm here now. What do I do? Tell me what to do. Uh, what is this thing? What am I meant to be doing? And of course there's always a middle 
middle ground here. Um, anybody that asks for help needs a little bit of orientation or a little bit of um, support to understand, absolutely. But I think that some of the things that we've um, started to think about in terms of especially explorers, like entering the system for a year as an explorer to um, maybe you'll know within a couple of weeks why you're here and what you want to do. Maybe it'll take you some time and that's okay. But the idea that there is um, an expectation that from the, almost from the first moment that you're expressing that, like, why are you here? What do you, what, what, what's meaningful for you? What type, how would you might, might, how would you like to get involved? What types of invitations? Uh, and, and I think that that kind of is that kind of quid pro quo where it is not like people enter and then they're just, you know, shoved into this, you know, system where, uh, don't know what to do. Um, so I, I guess Lisa, in your in your case, uh, talk about like what were some of the first kind of little rungs or or like gr grabbies that you grabbed onto to start to be able to orient yourself in the system. Well, the first thing I did was just get fascinated that I could look at what business development stuff was going on. So I sort of stalked the biz dev Slack channel for a while, and like, oh, isn't this interesting what they're doing and and like the types of things they're getting and who they're putting on projects and. And then I would look people up. And so I was just sort of getting familiar um, and then watching how decisions happen out loud was another thing that I was really interested in um, that I felt was novel and like I really loved. So that was one of the first handholds is that because as an explorer, I have access to so much of the inner working of what's going on, not everything, but like a huge amount of it. I could really see how this place worked and I could get a sense pretty quickly, like, is this the kind of place I want to be associated with? The answer was yes. And so like the next place that was a really good sort of handhold was the hike structure. So hikes um, are initiatives that we do every so often to improve greater than itself. And so, um, you know, everyone's invited to these hike kickoffs and people propose ways to improve greater than or experiments they want to do or you know all kinds of different ways to get involved and everyone can sort of see what those are can add to them can say I want to you know participate in this one um, and so that was one of the first tangible ways that I got involved in greater than was being involved in the hikes oh and the money game which was another which was an, an offer from the academy um, so something that I participated in myself and just fell in love with and I said what does it take to become facilitator of the money game? Well, as soon as you ask a question like that, then like a whole flood of information opens up and people are like, oh, well, let me show you the, the money game root document. And then it goes to this one and that one. And like everything you want to know about the money game is actually documented, including what it takes to become a facilitator. And I was like, oh, okay, that's what I want to do because I'm really passionate about that game getting inside of organizations actually. And right now we offer it publicly only. So so those were some of the handholds I found. Now I can imagine that people find different ones. You know, there are lots of different ways to come in and get involved. Um, but there was something sort of magical about me crossing the threshold threshold into being an associate. Because I could have been on greater than projects as an explorer, for sure I could have been, but that just didn't happen. But somehow, as soon as I crossed this, th this threshold and associate, people started thinking about me more, I think. And before I knew it, I was on two greater than projects and doing the kind of work I want to do, helping leadership teams, you know, navigate this world of self-organization. So um, it, it's, you're right that you don't want to provide too much of handholding, but, but just like, you know, rock climbing, having a few of those little rubber things to hang on to as you're climbing is helpful. And those were some of the ones that I found. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, you've got me thinking about other um, uh, participants in the system and what I've noticed about um, how they've come in. Uh, recently, uh, Lena Patel, who is a, an, ex, uh, an explorer in Australia, like started, again, much the same as you and I in terms of our like regular rhythm of conversations of slowly getting to know each other and uh, then thinking about how... Um, okay, this particular work that I'm doing is 
too much for me to handle as a solopreneur. This sound, this feels like a greater than gig. Hmm, wonder what it could be like if I, uh, if I started exploring this within the context of greater than. So this is another way that I've seen people start to, starting to enter the system. It, you know, friend, you know, talking about people entering and um, orienting themselves in different orbits of the organization. It's not just a one-way thing. It's just not like a foregone conclusion that you start as an explorer and you slowly wind your way or wind your way into the into the center. It, it's it's happening in the other way as well. So uh, talking about leaving or um, maybe not even necessarily leaving, but moving from from one uh, circle to the other. Talk about how that's that's felt for you and what you've noticed with um, um, some of the people in the system that have uh, been closer to the center and and have then chosen to move either to the periphery or into another orbit. Mm. Yeah, I think. To me, one of the real objectives with Greater Than was to allow for a system where we can sort of acknowledge different people's life stages and not have to have everything be black and white, like you're in fully or you're out fully. And I feel like that's one of the things that traditional organizations really lose out on because they can't stay connected as an ecosystem to people and that someone who, I mean, just basically the way the associates work, right? Someone who has relationships and connections with other groups can provide so much value by being a bridge like that. So yeah, to me, it always seemed really interesting to say, yes, like maybe someone's a partner, but guess what? They might then actually step back into being an associate or just being in being an explorer, which is something that we have had multiple cases of specifically two partners that were involved for quite a long time and who are now um, associates and uh, explorers respectively. And I think obviously there's cases where people decide to step out fully, but to me, it really, really is valuable to have that possibility for them to stay connected and to just, yeah, allow them to redefine their relationship basically with the collective over time based on what really makes sense. And I think that, as you were saying, Susan, it's a real two-way dynamic there. And that ideally, I think if one does this well, if there's enough spaces for people to reflect on their own relationship with the organization, with the work, to have other people to share about that with, and also to sort of, to get feedback or to get mirrored, like, how am I showing up in the system right now? Is this really what I need? Is this what greater than needs? But if that is healthy and working well, that people uh, reorganize themselves on their own and mm -hmm. basically find the right spot. Like, where do I fit right now in the levels? And that what I perceive is quite, uh, quite violent, traditional firing. This like, okay, you know, it's a top-down decision. You're out potentially, or the same, someone just resigning overnight and, and saying that they're breaking up basically. I, I really, I yearn for something that's a bit more, yeah, fluid and allows that to happen in a more natural way that you realize, oh, maybe this isn't the right place for me right now or not at all, or maybe I just need to change where, where which vantage point I'm in the system within. Mm. Yeah. And the system itself evolving to be able to, um, you know, potentially even meet more of those needs. One of the challenges of a collective um, is that we, we, we don't have the same safety nets as traditional companies do, right? Like we don't have a, a policy or a way necessarily to pay like long-term parental leave, for example. Um, we don't have a, a system of, you know, uh, Ha having those, you know, being able to con contribute to a pension in a traditional way. However, we're starting to build those. And I think that our relationship and our orientation around money, around uh, money being an abundant thing that, uh, that can create the conditions where we are all like, can be literally happy with the way that money flows throughout the system. Um, does 
create the possibility for us to have a longer term sustainability uh, that can um, acknowledge different life stages, but in a way that the compromise between, okay, so if I want to, um, if I'm thinking about, you know, becoming a parent, I have to leave GT for a while and go into a traditional organization because I know then I will be able, I will get, have insurance and be paid for that, for example. Um, or if uh, I want to go and, um, you know, go back and, and do some study or do some research that uh, I'm going to have to figure out a way to um, to do that outside of the context of DT. Um, you know what what are, what are some of the uh, things in, that you think are going to be necessary and interesting for us to um, think about moving forward to for there not to have to be that compromise? I guess is what I'm thinking of, Lisa. What comes up for you with that question? Well, I'm really I'm really impressed right now by the really courageous exploration that's going on um, within GT about what does a solidarity fund look like? What does it look like for us to be able to support one another when there are cash flow issues or when there is an unexpected illness or uh, you have to take elder care, you know, whatever life's circumstances are. And the fact that we can figure out how to fund that ourselves rather than having to capitulate to um, traditional insurance products or whatever is, it's really beautiful to me because, you know, it, just in that conversation recently, I got, I got the privilege of getting to comment on the work of the people who are, are looking into that right now. And I realized that all of the other jobs I've had before I started my own companies in organizations, employer, in, when I was an employee, like all of the meaning and the beauty of life is sort of outsourced to these insurance products. So like if I have, if I have cancer, I have long-term disability, I just go on long-term disability. No one at work needs to even know, like to your point, Fran, it's so violent. Someone just, you know, disappears one day and you're, and there's all this scuttlebutt, oh, I think she has cancer. You know, that's sort of how it happens. And I thought, well, gosh, that is so inhumane. It's sort of nice to have that safety net, but it also takes us so far away from community and humanity and interdependence and beauty. And so like the fact that we're contemplating having the solidarity fund where people would have to have conversations with one another about like, here's my circumstance. And I'm, you know, I'm asking for the organization to, to help support this difficult, whatever it is, this difficult situation. That's, yeah. that's beautiful to me. Yeah. And it's like, it's really putting our money where our mouth is, you know, like, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, difficult and beautiful friend. I mean, maybe we could close with you just like orienting around, like what's happening with you right now. And, um, the opportunity for you to step into motherhood and, and what that's going to be like for you and how, what we've created and greater than is able to support that in a way that, you know, you can be in your full love and humanity of the system and each other and all of us and not feel scared. Mm. Yeah. Well, as you've already shared, I'm, I'm about to go on maternity leave. So yeah, I'm a few weeks away from uh, having my first child. And yeah, I mean, I think that like, I guess it's a good example uh, the solidarity fund conversation is quite new and greater than it's definitely something that I've always dreamed about getting to. And I think that what's really important there is that we're super pragmatic and realistic though, about what we can do, right? Because we can't recreate what social systems create. And I happen to live in Spain. So here I can actually, I can get some benefits as a freelancer on maternity leave. So I think one of the key things that we've been talking about with this a lot is how to find an interesting balance between leaning on the systems that we're in, depending on what country we live in, and there might be some people in countries where there's nothing at all, and then having conversations and basically thinking about, okay, for each specific case, 
how can greater than support and is it financially support that's needed is it you know mentally is it you know actual physical things there could be so many ways that one can receive support and I guess I can just say for myself that like I don't feel scared at all because I just know that everyone has my back <laughs> I like I just don't feel worried about it but that's also just me and how I tend to I think approach these things like there's a very high trust that based on yeah if there's a difficulty we can talk about it and um that basically I think what we're trying to do with this whole solidarity fund is like give out the the initial signal of like if there's a difficulty let's talk and let's see how we can find a solution and like we're in this together not you're alone and you have to figure it out on your own and of course we don't know if we can pay you you know a salary for several years if you have a huge complicated you know health treatment we have no idea if that would ever be realistic but I think the starting point is like let's let's bring that here and find a way to support and to me that's like a very good combination of supportive but also realistic not being like completely naive about us as a small collective being able to provide like the full support that's maybe needed so yeah I'm yeah. quite excited where we're at with all this it's, it's super exciting and it's interesting that the topic of arriving and leaving well kind of like we've landed in this being well space because that's it's if it's not linear if it's not binary um all all of the possibilities are open um in the case of a collective like ours where love and trust and mutual aid and support and livelihood um, is at the center of um, how we are organized, the things we talk about, what's important to us, and how we steward this amazing thing that we've collectively created moving forward. So yeah, it's, I've, this has been a really lovely, enriching conversation for me. I hope it has been for um, those that are listening and just, you know, is always expressing my gratitude to um, to you, Fran and Lisa, for this really interesting adventure that we've been on with this, uh, with our um, sharing the inner workings of Greater Than. So thanks, everybody. See you soon. Yeah, thank you. Great chat. Yeah. Bye.